Hey, everybody. Today on the podcast, we have Walter Cruttenden, and we are talking about precession of the equinoxes and the astronomical cause of that phenomena. Because, as we all probably learned back in high school, this is generally a pattern thought to be caused by the wobble of the Earth's axis. But there's some problems with that. Namely, the fact that precession can only be measured with stars that are fixed, meaning that they're outside of our solar system. And so anything that's inside the solar system is not experiencing the same precession, the same perceived precession from Earth, which suggests that there's a deeper, stranger story that's actually happening. Because if the Earth's axis is wobbling and causing precession, then you would expect you would be able to see that with the planets. And so Walter's proposal, like many others who came before him, is that our sun perhaps has a binary partner that we are just unaware of. And as our sun makes motion with respect to that binary partner, this changes the background landscape of the constellations, resulting in the precession that we have inherited knowledge of since prehistory, essentially, right? The earliest records in history point to a tradition of being aware of this third cycle, not just the seasons, not just night and day, but another motion of our entire solar system. And that's what we are talking about today. And of course, there's this mythological tradition with the rise and fall of civilizations that the ancestors have pegged to this cycle. And so we try to sort of dissect those two aspects, the civilization level cycles and the astronomical cycles, and see to what extent are those related? Are they physically related? Are they analogous to one another? Is this the way that the ancient peoples told the stories about the rise and fall of their civilizations, or is there something more material to that hypothesis? Before we get to the conversation, we have a couple things to mention. Number one is our very first conference. We are gathering in Austin, Texas on April 7th and 8th of this year, and it's going to be a fantastic two days of talks, of conversations, and of eclipse watching. So if you have the means and the desire to get together with people that share your interests, consider coming to Demysticon 2024. The link for that is right up here. So get your tickets now and join in to the very, very first gathering of everyone who's interested in the ideas that we discuss on the podcast. Also, if you join our Patreon, you're going to get a significant discount on conference tickets. And we couldn't do this podcast without patrons. So thank you if you are already a patron. If you're not, consider just giving a couple dollars, especially if you want to see the quality of this show go up. You want to see us being able to put more and more time towards it, being able to get better guests. This is a lot of work. And really, a couple dollars from each one of you would completely power this operation to the absolute maximum that we can imagine. So we look forward to seeing you at the conference, at our weekly patron chat, and let's keep growing this thing. For now, on to Walter Cruttenden. The scientific revolution starts now. Yeah, so I'm really excited to just dive right into this. This is something we've been thinking about a good deal. And precession and binary star possibilities for our own solar system. Pretty far out, but there's some intriguing pieces of evidence too. And yeah, I want to just give you the floor to maybe introduce yourself and, and at least tell us. Tell us your theory. What's your yeah. theory? Tell us the theory and tell us why you even got interested in it in the first place, I guess, is, is something that's quite yes. useful. Because you're, yeah, you're not an astrophysicist by, by history. No. No, I've studied it for 30 years, but uh, not by degree, that's for sure. Um, in school, I mostly studied history, and it was actually history that got me interested in this uh, theory of history that's driven by astronomical motion. And as I kind of dug into it, first as a little boy, my mom would buy me books, you know, on, on ancient civilizations because I was always interested in that sort of thing. 
and then uh, more formally into just studying physics and astronomy, um, I, I started to see that it it could really be a possibility that the ancients might have been right that there could actually be this grand cycle of time driven by the you know the changing uh, cosmic motions. And indeed, that's the case with the smaller cycles that we see. Uh, as we mentioned before, the, the cycle of night and day is driven by the first celestial cycle, which is, you know, the stars go around us every single day. Everything rises in the east and sets in the west. And it's because the earth rotates on its axis. Uh, but we're so adapted to that. You know, it literally causes our change in consciousness. We we go from this waking state when the sun's out and a lot of activity and photosynthesis occurs, the whole planet lights up, to, you know, we go into a different state of consciousness at night, a subconscious state. And we believe that that's real in our dreams until we wake up again with the turning earth. And so... A celestial motion does drive this first cycle of time that affects us all, but it drives a second cycle, the cycle of the seasons. And so when I read that uh, the ancients talked about a third cycle, a great year, Plato's great year, uh, being driven by an astronomical motion, I had to find out everything I could about that astronomical motion. So that's how I got interested in procession. And the ancients realized this third cycle astronomically by what means? So they they were looking at the motion of the shift in the constellations and, and the location of the pole stars. Hold Was on, before it? we get into this, I just I really want to give people like the overview of the idea, which is that we have precession of the equinoxes, which is that there is this twenty four thousand year cycle, according to which the constellation that the sun rises in on the spring equinox shifts and it's a cyclical shift. And so every 24,000 years we return to the original constellation. And Milankovitch's explanation for precession is this, uh, is it, is it the axial wobble? I think it's the, is well, the, the lunar solar, the lunar solar. Uh, right. Theory, so, yeah. yes. So yes, we, we see three, things when we look at the sky and observe it for a long period of time. The first thing we see is everything rises in the east and sets in the west. And of course, Copernicus told us and, and proved pretty effectively that that's because the earth rotates. Everything really doesn't have to go around to us. The cosmos don't have to make that much effort. All we have to do is rotate and we see everything go around us. And then the second motion uh, he had to explain to sort of set off the Copernican revolution in the, you know, with the beginning of the Renaissance was um, why the sun moves through different constellations through the year. Uh, and of course, he, he told us that the earth orbits the sun. And this was sort of heretical thought at the time, you know, because the, uh, the the church and the the main belief system was no the earth's not moving i don't feel it move it couldn't be moving you know physics wasn't very well understood principles of inertia things like that but he used some math and science to kind of show that no it's it's the earth orbiting the sun and he actually got that idea from an ancient text aristarchus of samos who lived around 3 to 400 BC, so almost 2,000 years before Copernicus had come up with this idea and then it went away during the Dark Ages and Copernicus was resurrecting it. And then, yes, he had to uh, explain a third thing, and that is why, if the sun is immovable at the center of the universe, he said, why, when we look just on the equinox, and you can use the spring equinox or the fall equinox, um, why does the, the do the does the sun move through the constellations at the rate of about fifty arc seconds per year, backwards to the rate it moves during the year? So it was really a, a something that 
people were aware of because, you know, people have been observing the sky for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And um, he said, well, the only thing I could think of is the Earth's axis must wobble. And if it moves a little bit, then when we get to that same point on the equinox, we're actually not looking at the same stars. We're looking at a different portion of sky. And so, yeah, he called that libration or wobble, but he didn't have a, a reason for it. And so it wasn't until uh, Newton came along, roughly 140 years after Copernicus. I think Copernicus published in 1543, and Newton's, you know, around late 1600s, uh, 1680 roughly. And, and Newton's saying, well, if the axis does wobble, it must be due to the gravity of the sun and the moon tugging on the earth, because the earth's a little bit oblate. And so it, it's uh, it, not being a perfect spheroid, it, it would have a little bit of uh, axial wobble. And so uh, that was the theory that uh, Newton put forth to explain it. And and you're right about the, the timing there, Anastasia. It, it's, uh, it's roughly 24 to 26,000 years. And it's not exact because the precession rate has been accelerating every year. So at first, everyone thought, well, it's 25,920 years because that's 50 arc seconds per year. If you divide a circle by... 1,296,000 arc seconds by 50, you come up with, you know, that 25,920. <clears throat> but people notice the precession rate is speeding up 50.1, 50.2, 50.3 over the last few hundred years. And so the time it takes to complete a cycle goes from 25,900 to 25,800 to 25,700. So the cycle time is shrinking. And uh, so it's it's just one little facet of a procession that can help us understand its cause later on. But um, it was Newton who said it must be due to the gravity of the sun and the moon. And he said uh, that that, you know, uh, he actually didn't say it. It just people said, OK, well, that must account for all of the wobble. So people just assumed it counted for all of it all 50 arc seconds. and um, But Newton's equations really didn't work very well. Uh, Laplace uh, came along later and found out there were problems and, and other people, and they started adding in things and said, instead of just the sun and the moon, you know, the loony solar uh, forces, uh, it's Jupiter, it's Venus, it has some effect. And and then that didn't quite work. You know, 50 years would go by, they'd look at the sky, gee, the procession rate's speeding up, and it, it can't be, and therefore there must be other factors at work. And so this goes on and on and on. Every 40, 50 years, they're adding things in. And the latest um, procession formula now has about 3,000 inputs to it, you know, atmospheric conditions and stuff like this. Uh, but an interesting thing happened along the way that nobody cares about precession anymore. And the reason is, at one time, when you navigated a ship across the oceans, uh, you needed to know exactly where the stars were, especially if you're, you know, you're Captain Cook and you're going thousands of miles over open ocean. Um, you want to know where you are, and therefore you have to have know exactly where the stars are, and if the axis is wobbling that that's a little tough and so they used uh, the precession input into navigation formulas um, but by of course the early 1900s you know radios coming along and then radar and then computers and satellites and nobody cares about precession anymore and so the fact that the equation doesn't quite work is of is of no interest to anybody you know and so it's kind of become unimportant and yet it's it's the third motion of the earth and we know there's these huge cycles attached to the first two motions so i think we should understand the third motion and that's why i'm i'm dedicating my life to studying it 
you know, even though I'm not using it for navigation purposes. But I think it can actually help us navigate uh, life in a bigger way when we really understand the consequences of this motion. So let me get this straight. This idea is thousands of years old. Even the mechanistic scientific explanation goes all the way back to Aristarchus and Hipparchus. Is that correct? Like the idea that this that the, there's a wobble that accounts for this third cycle. Is that a ver- that, that's something that the Copernicus resurrected. So Hipparchus is 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 uh, credited with being the first uh, person to discover precession and know about it and talk about it, write a little bit about it. And I think he goes back right around to the, you know, the from the BC AD era, maybe 100 BC, something like that. Don't, don't test me on that one, (laughs) but right in there. And, um, and then, yeah, people kind of forgot about it during the dark ages, but got back to it around Copernicus's time, and then in the last few hundred years, measured it very carefully when they needed to, and now again, uh, not too many people care about it. But long before Hipparchus, you know, the great Greek, uh, many cultures talked about procession. They didn't call it procession per se, um, but they they talked about it as a motion of the heavens, and you find this in. You know, Mesopotamian writings, uh, you know, Polynesians are obviously, they're navigating seas by the stars. They really have it figured out. Um, even the uh, the Indians, uh, ancient Indians, you know, and they they call this cycle the Yuga cycle. One complete procession of the equinox is one complete Yuga cycle. And do they refer to that in, in astronomical terms, like in years? Do they they make predictions about the length of that? Um, they they refer to it as a, as a twenty four thousand year cycle. So it's very close to the uh, today's precession thing, within ten percent, say. Um, but it's it's. Uh, and then they they give some detail to break it into sort of sections, you know, just like the Greeks do. They break Greeks break it into the iron, bronze, silver, and golden age long before Hipparchus. Uh, uh, so did the Indians break it into the Kali Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, Treta Yuga, and Sacha Yuga. And so, yeah, you find it all over the world, and and they relate it to a motion of the stars, but they don't know or always say why the stars are moving around us. It was really Copernicus Western science said, well, it must be the earth wobbling. Copernicus saying that, Newton saying, well, if that's the case, then it's probably due to these big objects. And of course that hasn't, it, it's never been precise. And now, Aside from the precision, are there other problems with that model that, you know, which model? Sorry. The lunisolar wobble theory, or whatever, add however many planets you want onto it. Are there other problems with it? Yes. Yeah. No, there's there's a huge problem, uh, which not that many people are aware of, again, because very few people study it or care about it. Um, but the the biggest problem is that um, that precession seems to occur relative to objects outside the solar system but not relative to objects inside the solar system. We actually Wait, just I, discovered that this morning. Shiloh just discovered that this morning. Yeah, one thing I love to do with alternative theories is just go over and pick people's brains on the stack exchange because that's kind of where all the mainstream physicist nerds hang out at. And uh, nobody had a response to that one, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, that seems like a real death blow to this theory as far as like to the mainstream theory of Actually, a wobble. How how do you possibly explain that? Have you heard people try to explain that one away? Uh, the only way it's explained away is that you can't really use objects that are in the solar system to measure because everything's moving too much, you know. Uh, so you want to use things as far away as you can when you measure the Earth's motion. Uh, and that's why they use quasars, pulsars, you know, uh, VLBI, very long baseline interferometry, to look at these things that are 
not only outside our solar system, but outside our galaxy. Because, you know, the farther away something is, even if it's moving, it's going to look like a still point to you. And so I, I totally agree. Yes, that's better for measurement purposes. But if you actually do measure it relative to something within the solar system, uh, you don't see precession. And yeah, like the plane of the ecliptic should be stable, right? If you trace out the path of all of the planets, you can average them. And it seems like the planets should also be rising and setting in different locations with respect to their own orbital patterns, which have been documented for thousands of years, going back to the Sumerian star catalogs, right? Yeah, the Sumerians and the ancient Egyptians, uh, you know, we still don't understand everything they were doing. They, they have all these star motifs on, on some of these uh, hieroglyphic walls, and nobody completely understands uh, what they're doing, other than we know that they're plotting the stars. Yes. Mm. But there's, I guess my point is that there's ample rec record of the motion of and the orbits of the planets and their positions in the sky and so forth. You would think that that would be affected by precession as well, or at least have popped out. Yeah, because I'm like, look, if you have a sufficiently parameterized model that you can have hundreds and hundreds of factors that you've included to say that this is what's causing precession... And then when somebody's like, hey, but the planets don't appear to be moving, and you're like, well, that's just far too complicated for us to include. You can't really measure that. That just seems kind of like a cop-out. Thank you. This is why I like talking <laughs> to real scientists, you know, PhDs that understand. You know, because, yeah, there's so many areas of study. People, uh, most astronomers I talk to, they just say, you know, that's an interesting problem. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. Yeah. You know, people are into plasma physics or black holes or dark matter, dark energy, all these exotic things. And classical uh, mechanics is thought to be com completely mastered, understood. And so even if there is a little problem, it, it really can't be that important, right? And maybe, maybe uh, not, right? Yeah. That's actually one of my least, that's one of my cringe responses is when somebody tells me that they don't have the authority to comment on something. I'm like, all right, well, you're excused. Like, now tell me what you really think, you know? It's like, <laughs> I understand this isn't your professional opinion, but let's let's at least think here as human beings, not as experts, but just let's think about this, you know? I just think that people have a sense that it's impossible that we have missed such basic things. And I, I understand that because to live in a world that makes sense and to live in a world where you can look around and you could look at all of our science and be like, we're very technologically advanced, we're very wise, you have to assume that the basics are right. You have to assume that there will not be another revolution in the diagram of the solar system, that there will not be any great moment where we suddenly realize that, you know, as they did with the Cepheid variables in the 20s, where they were like, hey, hold on a second. I think that the universe isn't just the Milky Way. Yeah. I think there's something else yeah. to this too, which is that there might not have been an adequate replacement theory. And I think that it's very difficult to kick the legs out from underneath some paradigm, scientific, social, political, whatever, unless you have a better alternative in mind. And that seems to be where we're at, right? Because... There's you hit no the nail on the head. Yeah, yeah. Right there's no Absolutely. obvious. Well, you might think there's an obvious candidate, but for most people, most astrophysicists you talk to, there's not an obvious candidate uh, for something that would account for this, right? Right, right. Yeah, it's uh, it's a reference frame issue. Uh, you know, we all have different reference frames, and if we're all in a car together going 60 miles an hour, you know, there's no motion between us. We're in the same moving reference frame uh, but so what's happening in my opinion is that the the solar system is moving and uh, you know things outside the solar system uh, you cannot measure the earth that's in a moving uh, reference frame the solar system relative to something far outside the solar system and just say that that's reality because you've failed to account for the fact that you're in a moving vehicle, the solar system. And, and so that's why you, you see precession relative to things outside the solar system, but not inside the solar system, because precession is caused by the solar system moving. That's what precession is, the whole solar system 
moving. And I'm not saying that's 100% a procession or that the Earth's axis doesn't wobble at all because I do see a little bit of noise in there, but it doesn't appear to be any more than about two arc seconds. Therefore, the bulk of the 50 arc seconds every year is actual solar system motion and only a little bit of it is, is axial wobble. And the idea of the solar system being in motion is not just a linear motion, say, moving through the Milky Way galaxy. This is actually a proposal that the sun is part of a binary star system and it's orbiting another star, which do you guys know, do you have a proposal for what's... Well, but but to, before okay. we move on, like to be fair to the innovators of this idea, they didn't really know about galaxies and the motion. They didn't really think of the solar system as moving. Right, because yeah, they just that's... got done fighting this battle to put the sun at the center of the universe, essentially. Right, and so to be like perfectly fair to them, they had no concept of what we now understand is the solar system's motion through the galaxy, through the different spiral arms. These are pretty modern ideas. Right? They didn't even know that there were binary star Correct. systems up until like th what forty years ago, maybe. Yeah, but it, yeah, but even before binaries, right? Even before considering the mechanism for it. Like, they couldn't even consider the motion of the star, of our star, right? That's pretty mind-bending. That's a totally different paradigm than the way we look at things today. And then, yes, yeah, of course, read, binaries. Uh, if you read Copernicus, he's, he's always, he's trying to establish the sun as the center of the universe. Right. You know, they, there's no concept of galaxies, you know, local stellar neighborhoods, uh, interstellar clusters, anything solar systems they don't have those concepts at all and so yes that's the foundation on which modern astronomy is built and so it's been a lot of sort of patching and tweaking from there um you know but you're anastasia you you mentioned uh hubble in the 1920 yeah he he really brought us to this next level that, oh well, that's not just a smudge within our one universe those are like different island universes those are different galaxies out there and that, that that alone opened our eyes hey folks just a quick interruption to let you know that we absolutely depend on listener support to make this project happen to give more and more time to it and to ratchet up the production level for the show spend more time finding the guests that we all want to hear from and we need your help so please come over to patreon.com and join our community we get together once a week, have a roundtable discussion. It's a really, really special environment. And you can come and join us for a donation of as little as a couple dollars a month. So I'll see you there. And here's a link. <laughs> but so to get back to this point, I think there's multiple reference frames that precession per se is largely caused by our sun's motion around a nearby stellar object, uh, you know, a very close star. Um, and then there's, you know, no doubt motion around the local stellar neighborhood with a group of stars. And then that uh, cluster goes around the whole galaxy. And of course, the galaxies are all moving out from, from each other faster than anyone can believe right now. So it's a big, complicated universe. When, when did this binary idea first come on the scene? When well, when did people start? Let's start with when did people realize that a lot of stars had companions, and when did you know anybody even begin to entertain the idea that the Earth or the Sun, our Sun, might have a partner? Yes, uh, so I think you know a hundred years ago when when people looked up at and saw two stars very close together, they just thought it was two stars close together. It was only after telescopes became uh, you know, prevalent and and pretty good, and people took uh, constant observations to realize, oh, the star is actually moving around the other star, um, and so that's you know, in the last hundred years, the uh, the top astronomers realized that, and it's become part of the sort of the mainstream understanding, say, in the last forty or fifty years, uh, and it's only probably in the last twenty years that people have realized the uh that the majority of stars are actually in these uh relationships you know either it's it's the bunch in a in a cluster or it's you know two three or four but most are just two and um 
and even even then it, the the number was below the majority until they realized these uh, small red dwarfs and they could see better. And now when we see a bright star, you kind of zoom in in closer and you often find a red dwarf or a brown dwarf and realize, oh, they have a partner too. It's just a you know harder to see partner. And so uh, the latest estimate I heard was uh, around 80% and that's on the Chandra website. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, even yes. some of the closest stars to us are, aren't visible, right? With the naked eye, at least. You, you have oh. to you know, at least have some high magnification, but probably some infrared uh, telescopes as well. And these are just not things that would have occurred to people a few hundred years ago. Like the closest stars are just dim? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's it's quite a few. I want to say, well, I don't know the percentage off the top of my head, but uh, of the of the nearest stars to us, uh, a good portion of them are invisible to the naked eye. Yes, and we think that uh, the candidate to be our sun's companion star that is gravitationally bound uh, to another star is one that isn't seen with the naked eye, but one that we've science discovered about 100 years ago or so. Which star is this? Uh, This is a Bernard star. Okay, okay. Uh, We think it's the best candidate. And um, But you had asked me first about you know where did this idea sort of come from i was actually reading a a book it's it's called the the holy science it's by uh swami sri yukteswar and it's about the whole of science you know the holy science he's he's trying to put together uh, he's from india and so he's trying to put together sort of eastern science with western science sort of a spiritual science with a, a material science uh, and he thinks that's very important, and and he's talking about the yugas and you know the rise and fall of consciousness over long periods of time, and he just sort of mentions in passing that you know we're this book may be difficult to understand at the current moment because we're in a low age, and the reason we're in a low age is because our star is currently far from its partner star, and uh, and then he he has a little just one sentence in there and said you know that that moons go around planets and and planets with their moons uh go around stars and our our star our sun uh, with its planets goes around a nearby star which produces the backward motion of the equinoctial point he doesn't take credit for it he just says according to oriental astronomy so it's it's pretty ancient stuff because this book itself is written in 1894. Um, and, and so that's what I, I thought, oh, well, let's test that. You know, let's, let's really build a model of the current uh, procession theory and we'll build a model of what, of our sun going around another nearby star. And we found that, you know, we only need, five or six inputs to to do this model that Sri Yukteswar is talking about. And yet it's 43 times more accurate, we found, you know, in predicting precession over the last few hundred years versus what we find in the astronomical almanac, the actual uh, precession readings. So it's, it's amazing. Uh, and that's what kind of what got me on it. But he never mentioned what the other star was. And, uh, and so we went on this long search, you know, over 20 years or so to look at everything. And there's just a lot more information out just in the last few years. And uh, at the time that he wrote this book, uh, Barnard Star was not known. It wasn't discovered until 1915, 1916 by a Western science. So this book was written, you know, 20, 21 years before that. Uh, Which is uh, really, couldn't name it's it. kind of mind-bending, I think, to most people that, because Bernard Starr is one of the closest stars to us, for sure, right? I, I think that's really shocking that that we could have stars right up on our backyard and not know about them. I think that that would be a huge shock to most people. How far are we talking? I think five or six light so, years. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, um, I think the AA gives a definition right now of about six, but it 
the latest is about five nine. And yeah, so the closest uh, star system is Alpha Centauri. There's Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and um, Proxima Centauri. And there, that little cluster is between 4.2 and 4.4 light years. And so that's considered the closest. Well, it is the closest that we know of right now. And um, and so, yeah, the Bernard star would actually be the second uh, closest star. But, of course, it wasn't known until the last 100 years or so. And it's not a puny star, right? Isn't it something like several times the size of our sun? No, it's smaller it's, than it's our smaller? sun. It's smaller? Okay. Yeah, okay. it's about uh, uh, 17 percent of the mass okay it's uh, tiny but yeah but it's still you know fifty thousand earth masses uh and it's interesting because when we started looking at the binary research institute for a possible companion to our sun uh nobody was looking for anything like this and you know everything was fine with the solar system and then when um mike brown and um Constantine Batigen at Caltech and some other uh, astronomers uh, realized that, oh, they're finding all these dwarf stars that are, um, you know, I'm sorry, dwarf planets that are small Pluto size. And it caused them to uh, sort of reclassify our planetary system. Remember, we all grew up with nine planets. They said, no, there's only eight classical planets because we're finding so many dwarfs. We can't even add them in every year into the textbooks. And so uh, they're the ones that realized after they'd found half a dozen of those that, my God, they're all very similar. They have elongated orbits. They're all inclined to the plane. And they all have their perihelions, their closest approach uh, to the sun on one side of the sun. And so this is when, you know, 20. 15, 2016, there was a big buzz and said, you know, what, what is this all about? And is, are we correct in these observations? And, and so by 2017, uh, the Caltech guys were saying there must be a large mass out there. And that's when the official search for planet nine began. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's part of the story that you know, we were sort of the lone wolf looking for something. And and then they they came out and they said they were 100% sure there has to be a mass out there that's affecting our solar system because otherwise you need like five different explanations to explain all these things. And, uh, but uh, amazingly, you know, with with our tremendous telescopes today, our great technology, our computers that can, you know, put all these plates together, these photographs, and look at them and therefore see things move, uh, they haven't been able to find it. And uh, that that was totally unexpected. Um, as you probably know, you know, when they realized that um, uh, Uranus was acting strange, they found uh, Neptune pretty quickly after doing the math. And when they noticed that Neptune was acting strange, they found Pluto pretty quickly. Uh, and so now they find the whole solar system's acting strange. They figured they'd find something pretty quickly, especially with the instruments we have today. And that's why it's just a, an amazing uh, time here that all these great astronomers think there has to be something, and yet all we're hearing is crickets. Have you had a chance to talk to Batigan about this? Because we had him on the show probably... I don't know, probably like a year ago at this point. And he seems like he'd be pretty open to the possibility of of Bernard Starr being involved somehow. You know, I I wrote him an email, um, but just kind of left it at that. Uh, so no, I haven't talked to him. You know, I was up on the campus uh, not, not too long ago at Caltech, and um, I, I should have just reached out then, but I'll go back and do it. But yeah, I mean, no, I I'd, I'd, I'd love them to to look seriously at it cuz I think it's a solution to what they're looking for. It's just kind of it's it's a big leap for them because besides uh this being the thing that they're looking for and it really does fit, you know. They're looking for 
five to 10 earth masses, but 170 AU out. This is 50,000 earth masses much farther out, but it all has about the same effect. Uh, and so I think it really fits. But they also have to then grab this idea that that uh, precession has a totally different cause. And, and uh, It's one of the most interesting theory. things because we talk to people who are, you know, astrophysicists, people at NASA, and everyone universally when we propose that, you know, theories weren't changing is like, well, if there was good evidence for it, people would definitely jump on it because everybody wants to win a prize or they want to become known for a theory. And yet there's this really interesting tension of not looking too closely at ideas that don't come from inside of academic patterns. Yes. Yeah. No, it's that way in politics, business, everything. Yeah. If you don't come from from the approved uh, source, then yeah, you're you don't get much of a voice. That's okay. Can we talk about what makes Bernard Star particularly attractive? Because what I understand it, it has some appreciable motion, which is quite unique. I was actually yes. gonna. Um, I'm gonna step away for a second and grab our our Chromebook. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Some stuff up, sure. but you guys you keep talking. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, so it, yeah, Bernard it has, Star. Right, it has some exceptional proper motion, from what I understand. Yes, um, it's it's considered the fastest star in the sky, mm. um, and there may be other stars that are temporarily faster. You know, moving around, a, whipping by a black hole or something like that. But it's a, sort of a steady state, fastest star known. Um, and certainly in the in the local area. Um, when you ask people, well, why is Bernard's moving so quickly? They will say, uh, well, any object that's really close to us will have a higher relative motion. And that is true, of course. You know, if if uh if you're right next to a car that's going by, it's gonna appear to go, you know, very fast, uh from right few to left view versus one thousand miles away you know you barely see it moving um but even so bernard star uh, is moving much faster than alpha centauri and alpha centauri is is much closer you know it's about two-thirds the distance that the bernard star is right now and yet it's only going about one-third the speed so it's not uh just relative distance alone that's causing this high proper motion so there's got to be another reason. And if you talk to astronomers, physicists out there, they they will tell you properly that, uh, yes, when any, any object goes by another object, it'll get a, a gravitational boost or jump. And uh, this is how we fling sa satellites out there, Voyager, Pioneer, et cetera. They went by Jupiter or Saturn to, to, to get to the outer universe. Um, and save time and energy. Um, and so Bernard Star, uh, it's it's agreed that it must have gone close to something in the not too distant past, you know, 10, 20,000 years, something like that. It, it came close to another star and it's still showing some of that acceleration. But here's the most interesting thing about it. Um, if it did come close to something, yes, that would speed it up. But then that, that, it would slowly be, you know, decelerating now. And uh, the latest paper I've seen is that Bernard's is still accelerating. You know, it's moving faster. And so it's not only the fastest moving star in the sky, but it's moving faster. And that, that tells you, you know, when two stars or, or two planets, two objects are gravitationally bound, when they move when they're at their closest points, they're moving fastest because gravity is the strongest. And when they're at uh, you know apoapsis versus periapsis, they're they're at their farthest point and they're moving slowest. So whatever Bernard's is is moving closer to, uh, uh, it's 
you know, it's it should be going in that direction. It should be nearby, it seems like, right? And so much as the very, thing is approaching. Very it's nearby. Yeah. And there's, of course, and, the parallel, too, with the procession, right? Which seems to have this acceleration at the moment. Exactly, yes. And this is why procession needs to be part of the conversation. Um, and you get a twofer here, you know. You not only get to solve this thing that's tugging on our universe and elongating all the dwarf planets, uh, but you also explain procession. Uh, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's just, uh, it's just it, am amazing. Is anybody actively publishing on Bernard star at the moment? Like, are they, are people making predictions for what will happen? Cause I assume that people think it's just going to fly off into the distance eventually. And, and I, I found that there's, there's about 400 papers on Bernard star since 2020, but most of them are just trying to characterize it. And there's some proposal that there's maybe like a super earth sized planet that's orbiting it. But then other people are like, no, y'all are idiots and there's nothing there. And so it seems like I'm perplexed by how difficult it is to, to, to even evaluate this given the tools that we have. Yes, yeah. So Bernard's has been popular. It's in the the game world, Lexion. You know, uh, several games uh, use the planet around Bernard's star as a you know place that aliens might have come from and things like this. And so, uh, yeah, it's it's cool. But yeah, people aren't really looking at it as a companion star. They're just. Uh, but recently, it, people have talked more and more about. It's interesting that it's actually almost coming straight towards us. And it, of course, it's assumed that it will fly by because it's assumed that we're not in a binary system. Um, but if we're in a binary system, then obviously it won't fly by. Uh, it'll bend us and it itself will bend around us. Uh, and, you know, two stars in a binary system have a common center of mass. Well, any any two objects, the Earth and the Moon, have a common center of mass, um, and so they'll go around that point. Uh, and we think that that point will, you know, probably be less than a light year away. And so it's you don't need crazy speeds or new physics or anything to explain this. Uh, you just need uh, pretty much the solar system be to be going the speed that it's moving and. Bernard's to be going the speed that we see it moving right now. So how, it works. At that closest approach, how close would that put us to Bernard's star? Because the light year is basically still inside of our solar system, from what I understand. Um, so a light year is well outside our solar system. Well, I guess not. If, if you call the Oort cloud the, the outer limits of the solar system, perhaps oh. not. Yeah, okay. So you're, you're pushing the boundaries there. I don't know. I'm just I'm just thinking that seems really <laughs> close to me, you know. I've always thought that the Oort cloud is the if this this is a little bit loopy, but uh, if the star systems are cells or can be analogized to cells, that the Oort cloud would be the farthest reach of the the sphere of influence. It would be kind of the membrane through which things need to pass in order to enter into the area of the sun's influence. I like that thinking. Um, so there's a, a few issues here. So Bernard's, uh, the the mainstream says that it will be our closest star, you know, in roughly 10,000 years, which is coincidentally the time when uh, Sri Yukteswar says that our companion star will be at its closest point. And the mainstream puts that, uh, estimate, I think right now at about 3.8 light years, 3.7 mm. light years. And so that's uh, closer than Alpha Centauri is right now. Now, Alpha Centauri itself might be coming closer too at the same time. So there's no Bible on this. This is just, you know, current estimates. Uh, but that, yeah, that was only really recognized in the last, last two years or so because you know i've been talking to astronomers casually for 10 years and they they give me this list okay well if we aren't a companion if we do have a companion star it's it's got to be the closest star um and so you know bernard never made the list because of that and then uh so it's nice to have that checked off it's got to be the fastest star well bernard's clicking that one off and 
and a few other things. Well, what's really interesting about that three, what'd you say, 3.6 light years distance is the influence of those two stars would be overlapping significantly at that point. And so, you know, the Oort cloud, you know, it's it's still relatively theoretical, but we do need a reservoir for all of these comets, right? And so when we try to tie this astronomical story into the history of the Earth and the cycles of civilization and so forth, all of a sudden, you do have the possibility of interactions, right? Of dislodging uh, bodies which could come and become a, a threat or change the climate here on Earth. And obviously... From what I can tell, most civilizations have fallen because of some form of climate changing or or some economic stress. And so you really start to see the possibilities for what could influence life on Earth, right? Obviously, night and day affects whether we sleep or not. You know, the seasons affect how we grow our crops. Well, if there's cycles of, of let's say, impacts or, or disturbances to the atmosphere... What was that? Or inundation. Yeah, inundation in general. Tsunamis, you know, mo most of the Earth's covered in water, so impacts don't necessarily have to destroy a city for it to be uh, a threat, right? They, they can influence everything widely, uh, these impacts. Even if they don't impact the ground, even if they just explode in the sky, this can cause all sorts of havoc to the ecosystem and so forth. Well, the Oort cloud, right. there's a huge range for how, how big it's supposed to be, but basically they're suggesting that it ranges from a distance of 0 0.03 to 3.2 light years. And so, if and, and like assuming that the other star, Bernard star, has an Oort cloud too, now you have an interesting churning situation. I've actually asked, I feel like I've asked Batigan about this, or who was the last guy we had from Caltech? I asked somebody about this churning and they were like, well, the Oort clouds are so rarefied that, you know, you could mix them together and not not have them crash into each other. But it's like maybe, but I think that it's significant that you have these cycles that civilization began roughly 12,000 years ago. Like that's the that's the point where we can look to and we're like, OK, Gobekli Tepe is getting built up 12,000 years ago and we're missing time in between Gobekli Tepe and, say, Sumeria, but I think that that's just a problem of having dug stuff up because the way that we tend to find these ancient civilizations is that somebody's like, hey, I found this weird chunk of pottery. And then somebody shows up and they start digging and they're like, by God, a city. Well, the water really started flowing <laughs> after that point too, from what I understand, right? Sea level rise. Uh, and there's not a lot of uh, scientists who are also certified divers, so... The likelihood of excavating random places off the coast seems expensive and untenable. That's definitely true, but it's okay. So if it is a 12,000-year tw cycle, you're saying that Barnard's star is going to be on its closest approach in another 10,000 years? Yes, roughly 10,500 years. Um, so uh, the, the f closest point uh, before this would have been uh, roughly 11,500 BC. Um, and then the farthest point is 500 AD, which is near the depth of the Dark Ages. You know, every great civilization has collapsed Egypt, Sumeria, the Indus Valley, uh, you know, Greece and Rome finally giving up the ghost. And uh, so it, this cycle of the yugas the rise and fall of history fits very well with this cycle of of our companion star um yeah graham hancock's a good friend as you probably know we have this conference uh, every year the conference on procession and ancient knowledge and so we always have dinner and uh and he uh he's he's really totally into this as as you know this idea that there was some great cataclysm, and that's what his show Ancient Apocalypse is about, uh, that happened roughly when the, this Bernard's would have been near its closest point, and therefore, yes, possibly dislodged something in the Oort cloud that comes close to us, you know, within that couple thousand year period, it knocks something out. Now, is and, that in conflict with the idea that that should have been the Golden Age? Um. I don't think so. You know, uh, according 
to the yugas of ancient Indians, I really like their writings because they have so much detail on it. The, the Greeks give this real cursory summary of what each age is like, uh, but the Indians get into detail, and it's all about consciousness. And consciousness is is really having fun in the higher ages, you know. And we're much less attached to these physical bodies, you know. Just in the Silver Age alone, telepathy is supposed to be common knowledge once again, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't. I think you know things, physical things that happen on Earth. Uh, probably, you know, the consciousness cycle doesn't have to sync with that. Matter of fact, it, wouldn't it be fun if you you are an absolute master and you can witness this <laughs> unbelievable cataclysm coming to Earth? But that's getting a little speculative. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to tie it together. I'm trying to tie the astronomical to the civilization uh, level swings because th that's that's the thing that I'm having the hardest time with is is understanding how the presence of a star is going to affect ongoings on Earth at a cultural elevation level, right? I mean, I see that when there is no civilization, it can be a very hard and short life for most people. And there probably isn't a lot of time aside from maybe one guy in your tribe or your, your community who is the shaman to really devote themselves to you know, metaphysical issues and let's say thinking about how to treat each other better, how to live better, how to progress society, eventually civilization. Uh, but once you have civilization, you get specialization. At this point, people are unbelievable. We're so comfortable that, you know, uh, number one disease in, in the West is obesity, right? People have so much and that's, uh, that gives space for things like contemplation intellectual pursuits, arts, things that we think of as spiritually elevating, ideal, at least in their ideal form. Um, but those seem to be, I'm just trying to correlate those two with, with the motion of this star, because it seems like we're on the rise with those things at the moment, greater than ever before. The rise of art? The, just the ri rise of civilization. It seems like we're at a high watermark of civilization. Would you agree? I mean, it's hard to it's hard to say, right? Because on one hand, we have tons of technology, and we have the this ability to f fly across the world in hours, and have Zoom calls, and you know, access the whole history of information from my pocket, and so so forth. But it does. We've seem really like... come a long way since the depth of dark ages. No question. <laughs> yeah, right? Technologically. But... Uh, but there also seems to be a fracturing of people's hearts and minds, right? It's I saw this really, really interesting excerpt from a book the other day that was talking about how during the last world war, almost all of the psychiatric institutions in Europe emptied out. Like there was people who were schizophrenics during peacetime were driving ambulances during wartime. Like there's something about the pressure they had a of purpose. <laughs> right? And so I feel like we are advanced but purposeless and people just don't know what to do with themselves. And so if there is a high watermark for civilization, I would feel like a high watermark comes with great purpose. Okay. Because what, what do we have? Just toys? Like, Yeah. All right. So let's get into history because that's where we started. That's why we look for the explanation of precession and the binary star. And let me... Uh, offer this uh this book so this is a, a children's book i wrote it's called the great year it's just the the basics on on history according to the yuga cycle and down at the at the bottom uh, is when we're farthest from our sun so that's uh last occurred about 500 um, a.d or so and and at that point um all the great civilizations have fallen, as we talked about, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and this Sumer falls to Akkad, Akkad falls to Babylon. And by the time of the Dark Ages, you know, it's just nomads and tents. They can't build anything. It's really ridiculous how far people have fallen. And it's not due to just some catastrophe 11,000 years ago, because all those great civilizations came in between. So there's something else that's affecting consciousness. And up here 
at the top, you know, according to the Greeks and the Indians and a couple others, that's when we have the golden age, and that's when we're closest to this other star. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that there's something that's affecting consciousness outside of cataclysms, you know, that just interrupt uh, whatever the trend is at the time. Uh, that it's almost like, you know, during the day we have, when when the light comes, we all perform better and plants are productive and, you know, we can think more clearly because we're not asleep. And uh, and so there's, I think it's it's a force we really don't understand yet. There's some sort of subtle energy effects from another star. And I'm not saying it's Bernard's star. It, what Sri Yukteswar himself says is we go this we go around this other star, you get closer to it and farther from it. But that's actually the action which is bringing us to a, another point in space, which he calls Vishnu Nabi, the seat of Brahma, uh, where it gives rise to virtue and clear conscience and con high consciousness. Pardon the interruption, but before you go, I just wanted to take a moment to remind you to purchase tickets for our very first scientific conference, Demysticon 2024. It's going to be held in Austin, Texas on April 7th and 8th to coincide with the total solar eclipse that is passing through there. We have about a minute and 30 seconds of totality for us on Monday, and the rest of the time we're going to spend exploring ideas as a community. And we really hope to see you in Austin because I think it's going to be a really special event. For now, back to the conversation. And and so the Greeks give us these easy ways to understand it. In the in the lowest age, it's an iron age. You only know what you can perceive through your five senses, because the sixth sense is dead; it's gone. And so you think everything is very very material. And it was that way up until just you know just the last couple hundred years that we finally discover this whole world of subtle energies, electricity and magnetism. Everything's made out of cells or molecules, and these are made out of atoms, and they're made out of electrons, protons, neutrons, etc. And and that there's huge amount of spaces between there. So there really isn't any matter. You know, it's it's like this whole new paradigm shifts occurs as we go from the Kali Yuga, the lowest, this Iron Age, into the Bronze Age. And this Bronze Age, which is going to unfold for another few thousand years, is supposed to be an age of tremendous technological advancement. Uh, and what is technology? It's just a manifestation of our cleverness. Our consciousness is increasing, so we can build things we couldn't build before. We can know things we couldn't uh, know before. We can see th through telescopes things that we could never see. We could see through microscopes things that we could never see. And so that goes on for a few thousand years. And then you have the uh, the next stage, the, the Silver Age, the Treta Yuga, according to the Indians. And that is an age of uh, the mental age, uh, age of telepathy. And the last uh, images of that that exist on Earth today uh, would be called a pre babel age. It's before God confused the tongues, you know, in the Christian vernacular. And uh, mankind lived in tune with. Uh, with nature and uh, Hesiod, the great Greek historian, roughly you know one thousand seven hundred BC, somewhere in there, uh, tells us that uh, the Earth gave of herself freely. You know, we lived in such virtue and harmony that that it's just that it's wonderful. And uh, he laments the times that that are coming. You know, and the the old Babylonian uh, scriptures. You know, in in Cuneiform, we find they're aware that they're in a down cycle, and they're they're concerned about it, uh, and they're dead right. You know, we go from these great cities of ancient uh, Sumeria to to just nothingness by the time of the Dark Ages. So yeah, there's that age. I unfortunately we can't understand. We don't have the consciousness now in this conversation to to perceive of the higher ages, but the little myth and folklore that we do have about wizards and uh, amazing miracles, uh, you know, we, we just 
can't believe them because they just don't fit with our, we've just barely out of the gross material age. We're just starting to discover, you know, higher forms of consciousness. And so that's my view of history, that it's really driven by consciousness much more than uh, outer events and cataclysms. Yeah, because there's 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 two different ways of looking at ancient mythology, right? One is that the ancient peoples had a great deal of wisdom at, at some points, and from their overwhelming experience on Earth, right? They were preserving these ancient, let's say, ways that humans should behave, the way that consequence enacts itself, right? If you behave this way, this will happen, you know? And they tell these stories, and they use the planets, and they use the constellations to memorialize and illustrate, right? It's almost like their PowerPoint while they're telling these stories. And the idea that civilization, or let's say human consciousness, because these are two very different ideas, that they would have a natural progression to them, seems in some sense unquestionable. It seems like civilizations rise and fall. People, you know, become enlightened and they fall into darkness. This certainly happens. Um, in terms of pegging them, those two together, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's even as important as the recognition that these cycles are important for human progression. And that now, like you say, we've reached this technological maximum, but do we know how to responsibly behave with all of this newfound power, right? What well, does that does having the ability to manipulate the environment to to make yourself comfortable, does that actually solve all your problems or does it make a new set of problems? And if it does, then which it does seem to be doing, right? With the, you know, all of the social issues we have today as a result of social media and instant connectedness, but at the same time people are more isolated than ever before. People don't spend as much time in, in real life with their friends that they used to when I was a kid, for instance. So that's a whole new set of challenges. So it does not, I guess this is a bit rambly, but I'm, I'm trying to say that I'm not sure that technological civilizational level progress is necessarily pegged to conscious enlightenment at the same time. They seem to be out of phase at times. Because like power without values is basically, you know, the character of Lenny and of mice and men. Like squeezing the bunny to death. Yes, uh, there's there's wonderful problems uh, to solve in today's world. You know, there's so many opportunities for each of us to be a hero. Uh, oftentimes, the Bronze Age is called the Hero Age. You know, in Greek mythology, um, and. And so, yeah, we're going through that. And if you think about it, technology is sort of comes out there developed by the brightest minds, the people that are sort of on, on the edge of higher consciousness, you know, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and people like this. And, and, and we have a free market system, so it gets out into the marketplace pretty quickly and efficiently nowadays. And it is beyond the capabilities, the consciousness, uh, of the ordinary person to responsibly use. And it, it makes uh, for a, a gloriously interesting world um, full of problems. And I, I just think that's the nature of the times that we live in. Um, so yeah, we're, we're rising in consciousness and it's, it's manifesting in our technology. Um, but just as we have this ability to cause problems, we'll have we also have this higher consciousness to think of solutions to. And man, I, I find it so fun. Uh, Yogananda, who was a disciple of Sri Yukteswars, who wrote that, that book, uh, and, you know, um, well known to, to Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs gave out Yogananda's book at his funeral. It's the only book he had on his iPad. Uh, he used to say that, you know, the Tupara Yuga is a dangerous time because mankind's coming from this material age, so he still is creating all these material things with his higher consciousness, but he doesn't yet have the responsibility of, the, of you know, the higher ages. Um, but he said, don't worry, it only lasts a couple thousand years, and then you're through it. 
Something that I think that needs to be invented in order to shuffle us through into the next age is an economic system that works better than the one that we have right now. Shiloh pointed out something really interesting the other day, which was that, you know, when there's a lot of transition towards digital currencies. And in order to transition towards digital currencies, you and often, credit based economy, you know, and finance. credit based economies like finance economies. And in order to transition to those, you have to have an infrastructure, and the people who maintain the infrastructure will sometimes take a fraction of each transaction. And so, when you used cash, and you say you had fifty dollars, and you paid fifty dollars for all of your goods and services, that fifty dollars, yeah, there were taxes that were taken out of it at each step, but f- that was the only amount that was removed from the transaction and so at the end of the chain you had and ostensibly the taxes go back into your well-being ostensibly i'm sure that i'm sure that plenty of people would disagree but 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 at least that money is preserved right that 50 dollars is still worth 50 dollars a hundred you know transactions later but when you siphon off a little piece each time you actually end up at a point not too distant future where your 50 dollars is actually only five dollars of buying power because it's been you know sort of whittled down by all of these transactions. There's like a 25 cent fee on every time they use a credit card. For somebody. Maybe it's the vendor, but yeah, somebody I don't know if it's 25 cents, but it's 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 not nothing. Sure. And so what what are the economic systems that are absolutely 100% not communism that uh, get us to a place that is more stable for people to live in is that even possible in a material universe or is there some sort of transcendence that needs to happen where you know it's the world economic forum of you will own nothing and be happy Ooh, um i don't know i come from the fintech world that's how i made my money um and what's what's in, fintech sorry oh financial technology oh right right uh yeah so i I founded uh, Roth Capital, uh, my f- first firm, and we did, you know, hundreds of underwritings and raised billions of dollars for companies. And and then um, um, my last company I did with my son is called Acorns. Uh, it's 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 an app, and <clears throat> you connect your cards, and then anytime you spend, uh, we round up the change to the nearest dollar and invest that for you in the markets. Uh, and so you're, you're getting a, a broad diversified portfolio. Um, you're saving and investing every day, but it's so small, it's not painful. You know, people have a tough time starting because they never want to put thousands of dollars away. But if you're putting 50 cents away, it doesn't hurt. And so, uh, yeah, we're up to, I think, 6 million customers and yeah. we manage about $7 billion now. And uh, it's I think I think the thing that people are afraid of with these market. automated investments is that there isn't a human heart in the decision making. In so much as you know, if you have IRA or or you know or index, index funds, funds or yeah. y- these are sort of automatic processes that are making your they're making you money. Well, they're at least fighting inflation, right? So you'd you kind of have to participate in them if you have any accumulation of savings, right? But at the same time, you, you these companies are being selected for by their growth rather than by what they're really doing for the well-being of the society, the civilization, and so forth. And I think this is what's really scary to people. It's not that it's not a smart idea. To I think it's also hard for people to start. I think that it's just, it's, I think Walter's totally right. Like, oh yeah, that sounds like a really like valuable service. Dropping $1,000 into an account for somebody who has maybe, you know, $2,500 in their bank account seems absolutely insane. But once you're involved in that investment cycle, right, as you definitely should be if you want to not lose your money to just va- to vaporize to inflation or whatever, you should be investing your money. But the question is... <sighs> Are those automated processes going to make decisions on a global scale that aren't necessarily in line with what we want to be as human beings? Right. So, boy, there's a lot of Nobel laureates that, that write about this subject, and obviously, ESG is trying to answer you know your um, your concerns there, and so BlackRock and you know Vanguard and other people have you can buy portfolios where there's 
people, you know, trying to select out certain companies that might be bad. And they actually underperformed because, you know, they selected out certain of the oil and gas companies, for example, in the last cycle. And so we, we do all those studies and, and, you know, not underperform too much, but a little bit. Um, but I, I think the, some of the, the real studies in this area would, would say that there are, um, there are conscious decisions going on at, at every level. You know, there's people that work at these companies that are just like you and me, and the majority of them are really trying to do good and make a better world and, and have good lives for themselves and their families. And, um, and so that's, that's why indexes work. Uh, you know, most people cannot perform as well as an index because they'll flip in and out. They'll get scared when the market's down and they'll sell exactly when they shouldn't be. Uh, and so by just staying in these indexed things, you're harnessing uh, the, the, you know, the capitalist uh, power of companies and you're doing that in a way that uh, gives returns that are over and above the inflation rate. And, you know, it's proven. You can look at all all the charts all the time. So, yeah, you're right. If you just sit in cash or look at the value of your cash, it's always dwindling because governments are always going to spend more than than they're taking in, you know, unless unless there's a revolution, then they reset for a while, and then, then it seems to get out of hand over long periods of time. But, uh, yeah, you get 10% returns on average per year just by being in the broad, uh, harnessing the capitalistic system, bright minds developing new things, working for you uh, to grow your money. You know, get a much better return than just sitting in cash. But of course, some of the like the big fang companies, right, are are some of the b biggest growing investments right now, um, and it's unclear whether ESG is going to be able to deal with, you know, things like the the polarization of society or the isolation of individuals, and 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 these are the the strange decision making fractures that are going on right now because it's obviously really good for a social media company to hijack your attention but it's not necessarily good for you as a person and, and the, there's, a, there's a stark conflict of interest there it seems like there's a really fascinating video from this last the last new year celebration i don't know if you saw it but it was at the arc de triomphe in paris and it's the crowd that's there watching the ball drop and every single person in the crowd is videotaping on their phones and so there's a I think there's thousands of people that are on this alley and every single person is holding a phone recording the exact same shot. And in the shot, you can see, you know, the crowd of everybody holding their phones and off in the distance are the fireworks on the arc. And it just seems to kind of tie into this idea of the next phase being one of consciousness rather than being one of materialism. Because what is the metaverse if not a transition towards a consciousness only universe. Well, well you can, ask great questions. I I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, what do you what do you mean by consciousness only universe? Well, okay, so uh if you live in a pod and you're tied up into something that, you know, you have a feeding tube, you have a waste tube, you're living suspended in, you know, sensory deprivation Matrix style. chamber. Matrix style, yeah, right. I mean, like, I think that you you have to look at the 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 pop sci mythology or the the popular mythology from science fiction in order to get a sense of what there is to be afraid of or to to warrant avoiding. Because you know, nineteen eighty four is prophetic in some sense. You you look at Snowden's disclosures about the way that the government maintains records on everybody, and immediately you're like, oh, well, I wonder if that was a was it already inevitable in 1948 when, when Orwell wrote that, that this was the, the culminating arc in the same way that it is inevitable when the Wachowski brothers are, you know, Nostradamus of 50 years in the future, that this is the thing that people go towards because life is really hard. Material life is really difficult. So you look around at animals and they spend all of their time gathering food 
They spend all of their time maintaining their houses, maintaining their territories. There's not a lot of, you know, free time and revelry, it feels like. Everybody's kind of like always aware and casing the joint to make sure that nobody's coming after them. And I think that I look at domesticated animals and like my cat, like she comes to live with us over the course of evolutionary history because every cat before her has been like, this is way better than like hunting rats and eating entrails. Like she gets her wet food, she gets her dry food, she has a nice place to sleep, she's asleep on the heater, she's got the windowsill, like she gets to watch the cats from inside where it's nice. <laughs> and so there is this evolutionary draw of certain species towards comfort. And I feel like technology in its metaverse manifestation is the draw towards the greatest possible comfort. Every single one of your needs is met. And you allow yourself to live a life of the mind alone, where you can be everything that you want to be inside the metaverse without the dire limitations of, you know, the Pareto distribution of resources and accomplishment that is part of the physical universe. So you're saying the metaverse to you is is heaven is the ultimate it's the golden age golden age. I mean, I, I guess think... I'm looking like one step past that golden age. What's really creepy to me about this whole model is that the golden age doesn't last forever. And so, right, if if the metaverse is this golden age, then it seems like the fallout from that would be the like somebody's going to be like, wait a second, I think we had ultimate consciousness when we were just able to ambulate around and have interactions directly with the environment <laughs> yeah because uh, so uh, uh, shina and i were, were thinking about this last night as we were watching the great year where it's like it's almost like it's a, a spiral in addition to the circle where you're not returning necessarily to the same place where you were before but you've somehow you've you've gone up the ramp a little bit and so there's a dislocation because now you are entering into a golden age that will descend into something that is informed by the most recent beginning of the golden age, which is different from the or previous Or maybe not. Age. Maybe they had the metaverse before, and we just don't know about it. I mean, one thing that's really, really scary to think about, or shocking at least, is that this whole technological ramp has been going on for, what, 100 years or something? Do you think that we would see 100 years worth of... Right? We don't have any stone tablets that record what's all of this progress what's happening right now i mean if this was to get all vaporized by an asteroid or something and you know a few thousand human beings survived i don't know that people would know have any record of that in the next rise yeah like twelve thousand years from now what remains of what's written on the internet right much of it would be destroyed in the form that we understand it and so if they did have a form of uh data storage in the higher ages, uh, what would it look like? And I talked to a scientist, a friend of mine, John Daring, uh, physicist at uh, Scientific Research Applications, um, who has some wonderful thoughts on the ideas. And he points out that uh, today we, we store data in stone, silica. Um, and if you look out in nature, uh, any stone that exists uh, has received all the vibrations that have gone by it. Uh, and, and so it essentially is a record of all the conversations held by it, all the weather that's occurred around it. However, the imprints are so subtle uh, that we, we just don't have the ability to, uh, to pull that out right now. Um, but he would say that, you know, with much higher consciousness, whether or not we're turning that into some terrific technology that can pull this information out of the stone, or whether or not we just have that consciousness that can intuit the information there, that there probably all that, all these ancient stories, all this past information is existing in the landscape all around us. And and that is the the higher form of of storage, uh, according to this, my friend John Darren. Not a great thought. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean it, it. It is out. The truth is out there, as they say on the X Files. Um, it 
it also strikes me that mythology is an interesting vessel for that. You know, I think that a lot of people in the modern age tend to look at the mythology and the religion, the proto-religions, the early religions, as being these kind of superstitious daydreams. You know, we we have a tendency to look at these people from our technologically advanced position as kind of, you know, a little wacky, superstitious, you know, silly, uh, let's say, unevolved even, right? And and I don't, I think that's a mistake because I think that these myths encode real wisdom about how to live your life, let's say, or how to conduct your civilization um, that people have discovered over the hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution. And the stories seem to be something that persists. Like the fact that people tell somewhat well, in some cases, very similar stories on opposite sides of the earth from thousands of years back. Some of these myths that are encoded, you know, about the bull and Orion. And I don't know, it's just, it, it speaks to something that's at the heart of, of humanity. Some, some really, really fundamental wisdom about what it means to be a person in the world and to interact with your neighbors and to interact with the landscape and the ecosystem. It seems to be a real repository. I agree. Yeah. You know, in in the material age, when you just think everything's an evolution of just physical, pure material things, then um, then you you come up with a Darwinian uh philosophy. And in that philosophy, anything that came before us must be more primitive, right? And therefore you have to denigrate the um the teachings of the ancients because they came before us. Uh so yeah, it's 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 that physical approach to history is kind of uh, at cross purposes to what we find because some of the ancient teachings are very, very wise. Um, One of the best books I've read on this is um, Hamlet's Mill by Giorgio de Santiana and Hertha von Deschen. Yeah, just brilliant scholars. You know, he was uh, head of the history of science at MIT and she was uh, an anthropologist out of... um, uh, Frankfurt University, the Goethe School there. And they got together to find the origins of science, which is a wonderful uh, enterprise. And so they had to look first at just what are the oldest writings we can find, where are we going to find the first math, the first physics, things like this. And that takes them to scripture, and that kind of takes them to myth and folklore all around the world. And they're the ones that discover that the ancients are really tuning into not just nature, but the sky. And they're the ones that are watching the heavens. And and so they come out with one of their, sort of their findings in this book that ancient cultures were very much aware of procession and they would tie different epochs, different eras, ages to conditions here on earth. And they might have had different names for them. They didn't always call them the Iron, Bronze, Silver, and Golden Age. They might have called it Ice Age or the Wolf Age or the Axe Age or whatever. Um, but then they associate that with conditions. And they they said, you know, you can tell where we are in that by the position of the stars in the skies. And yeah, so they paid great attention to uh, this sort of this higher uh, hierarchy history, if you will. There's a really interesting trend these days to stop the cycles. The desire to stop the cycles, I think, is central. When we, t- when we talk about climate change, the idea is that we will stop climate change and will allow us to, in perpetuity, continue the project that we have begun. Let's, I mean, let's say with Gobekli Tepe, right? So that's the last ice age. And let's say that there's a a thread that runs through everything from then to now. And so we need to maintain the conditions that have allowed our societies to grow up to the degree that they have grown up. And so what we will do is we will cease change. And there's a part of me that feels like the change is really necessary in order to have evolution, in order to have development, in order to have growth. You must go through these cycles. And I feel like what we want is we want to use all of our technology and to harness it to stop things from changing. And that's a little bit freaky for me because on one hand, I understand why, like you want your civilization to survive. It doesn't, it's, it's great. I think that the, the world that we live in is in many ways better than 
any other world. Less slavery, less war, less starvation, uh, better food, you know. Child mortality, right. disease. Yeah, like, I think that uh, we looked this up the other day. Was it, I think, 400 women in every 10,000 died in childbirth like 200 years ago? Wow. Right? It's just like, it's insane statistics. And like, the kids yeah, didn't live past now. the age of five. What was that? Yeah. We've come a long, long way, and I think that is a sign of, of, of this cycle of the yugas. You know, I just don't think it's some sudden acceleration in, in evolution. Like, because where was evolution? You know, two thousand years ago, when the Greeks were active, twenty five hundred years ago. Why didn't the Greeks have a, uh, you know, a Renaissance? They had all sorts of things. They Geared devices, the anti-cathera device, you know, completely disappears for a couple thousand years before it's rediscovered. We develop geared devices again, batteries and optics and things like this. Yeah, and I think it's totally reasonable to think of ourselves in some sense as a progression of that same culture. I mean, I pointed it out before, but we still have very Greek-looking courthouses, capital buildings. We still use in so much as the Romans were the ascendants to the Greeks, the descendants to the Greeks, right? We we use their language and law and medicine, this Latin, right? Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. I think in some sense, we're part of this tradition of civilization, which never really disappeared. It just kind of took on new forms over the years. Yeah, it went underground. You know, you talk about, we don't like change, but every day we have Big change, you know, day gives way to night and we, we go into a subconscious state and things are dark and, and every year, you know, uh, summer gives way to fall and fall to winter and uh, the earth is less productive. And it's, it's the way on the longer scale. We just have forgotten this third motion, the procession. And I think when we understand that, we really start to put history back in perspective. And uh, that's why that's why I do what I do. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I mean, I think people I think people are aware of that fundamentally. They're aware of those bigger cycles. They see societies come and go. They see, th see things go underground. And there's a real poetic analogy to be made there. And of course, we do the same thing. Like you said, there are these natural cycles day and night. But we also will say things like, the long night of the soul, or, you know, it's very easy to look at the human life too as having like a, a sunrise, like, you know, the sunset retirement community or something, right? <laughs> like, this is the way that we think about our lives. And so, you know, the fact that there'd be different scales of those rises and falls also seems to play out um, both in the heavens and, and in, on our planet, in our world. Yes, but, but when you've forgotten one, then it's, uh, something's bothering you. You don't know what it is. There's some angst. There's, you know, a stress. There's an anxiousness. And, you know, Graham Hancock likes to say there's an amnesia that's, that's set in. Uh, you know, we've forgotten a big part of our history. And it's it's really throwing us off at this time because if if we understood where we were going, I think we'd be a lot more confident about it. And but we don't. And well, I and think so. that we want to control it. I think that that's the the defining characteristic of our age. Like the technology has given us the sense that we are able to transcend the power of the cycles. And I think that it's not an accident that that has emerged the technology that allows us to do it is largely emerging from california a place that is almost seasonless it is if there is a place that is eternal it is california if the first people that figure out how to live forever or live to be 500 they will come from california and i think that that is not an accident i think that there's something about this place because we're sitting in the east bay right now there's something about this place that... Well, we're not in the Bay. <laughs> yeah, East Bay, which is the eastern part of the San Francisco Bay Area. There's something about this place that gives you the illusion that it is possible to remain forever the way that you are. Everything from the building codes to the technology that comes out here is all centered around the idea of 
we will master nature and we will drive it to our needs and we will take silicon and we will make it into machines that think and we will recreate ourselves and we will create an intelligence that we will be able to harness in order to accomplish all of these things and forever after we will remain in this in this state that is unchanging and that i think is maybe the source of the tension because you can't stop procession. You can't stop the fact that the solar system is in one place now and it will be in a different place a, th a thousand years from now. Or that civilizations will accumulate errors and that will lead to their collapse inevitably. Yeah, because like biology works on the basis of, you know, you accumulate enough mutations and you die out. An yeah. organism, that's what aging is, right? And it, the, the most contemporary theories of aging is the fact that like your unit, your, your subunits just stop coordinating. And properly. institutions age similarly. This is well known. And so if you have a position where you've basically said, these are the institutions that we will maintain and we will put all of our resources onto maintaining them forevermore, I feel like that's a huge source of tension because people look around and they realize that renewal is necessary. And yet we yeah. have no paths to renewal that maintain the larger structures. Yeah. So yeah, um, cleverness and technology can help us uh, avoid the worst parts of the down cycles. And so we invent fire to stay warm and see during the cycle of night. And, and we can have blankets and houses and heaters to stay warm and, and get through winter and storage facilities and things like this. But none of those stop the cycle. The, the cycle is driven by much larger forces, cosmic forces. Uh, and so, yeah, we're operating within those, those cycles. And I think we just need that understanding that the cycle goes on. And we need to understand what each of the cycles are and then act appropriately accordingly. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Yeah, this is really fascinating. I want to definitely try out some of these ideas <clears throat> excuse me on some of my astronomer astrophysicist friends in the future and maybe we can check back and see uh what that synthesis looks like maybe we'll even manage to get you together with one of these these characters at some point because yeah, uh th there's some really open-minded folks we've talked to who is that gentleman in france do you remember his last name i'm really sean raymond um, sean raymond yeah he's a very sean interesting raymond. guy um, and I'm looking to make better friends with him in the future. He does these sandbox uh, modelings where he'll try on different configurations of solar systems, try on different, you know, if we move this planet here or if this star passes by at this distance, well, how will that change the orbits? And he's, uh. he's managed to publish quite a bit on this. Uh, totally hypothetical. Nobody's bothering him because <clears throat> he's the first to admit that you know, he's just playing around. It's He's not saying this happened in the past. It's just like, well, what if it did? What would that have looked like? And so it'd be fun to talk to Sean and uh, maybe get you guys together. Yeah, I'd welcome that, yeah. Somebody out there should go win a Nobel Prize on this stuff. You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Well, yeah, maybe that's part of the problem too. I, I don't know how, and I worry about Nobel Prizes because it doesn't seem like there's much room to, change your mind after you've gotten a Nobel Prize. <laughs> no, I'm just, I just want to understand history and what drives it. And it's driven by much bigger things. And, and I, I think it's important that we don't forget the cycles, you know, because it really informs who we are, where we came from. And um, much of this knowledge is, you know, is embedded in ancient wisdom and the saints and sages of the east and there's a lot we can learn right there absolutely yeah. where can folks find out more about your work uh the our main website is the binary research institute uh, so dot <laughs> org and uh it's uh it's uh you know some of our papers and proofs and things like that it's the math is there if you will and then we also have a site called Lost Star. Uh, it's it's based on my book, um, you know, Lost Star of Myth and Time. And we're working on uh, another documentary to sort of be a sequel to the one that you saw last night. 
a great year and working on a sort of a feature film uh film project about this whole thing too just to get it to the masses you know it seems like ideas can almost get out there easier if you just put a, the wrapper of fiction on them and you know you convince people we're much greater than we are if, if we can all see superheroes that can do it and things like this so uh, that's that's the way we're trying to get some of these ideas out there absolutely that's very cool that's smart cool well thanks for coming by it's been uh, very eye-opening definitely hey Hey, thank Open, you. Alerted me to a problem I wasn't aware of, and I'm I'm stoked. So thank you. A real pleasure. Thank you so much. Just to I hope we meet in person someday too. Yes, Definitely. let's let's make that happen. Where are you located at physically? By the way, remind me one more time. I'm about 500 miles south of you in Newport Beach. Okay. Yeah, we yeah. could definitely. We're, we're always traveling up and down the coast here. Good. Look All forward right. to. It. Okay. All right. Take care. Have a great rest take of your day. Care. Likewise. Bye, everybody.